Hey church, it is time for Bible class. We are going to do something a little different this week. I'm at home. It's a snow day, but it's Ash Wednesday, and so we're going to talk about Ash Wednesday. Ash, wish, Ash Wednesday is the beginning of the season of Lent. Lent is that season that leads up to Jesus' um, uh, arrest and crucifixion and ultimately his resurrection and ascension in the way that we tell the story of Jesus and what it means for us. And Ash Wednesday invites us into this tension as Jesus leads toward the cross. Uh, it invites us into this tension by reminding us before we get to the glory of Easter that first we, we die and we are dead in our sins. And so what we want to do today is we want to leave off the God who is present for just a week. And we want to take a moment to sit in this tension. We want to talk about death. And in talking about death as it runs through the scripture, we are not going to talk about how God addresses death. As a matter of fact, we want to kind of just let that sit and, and work on us for a while as we head towards Easter, as we think about all of the ways that death impacts us. And then, having come to anticipate what God is doing, eventually we will get to Easter and we can celebrate what God has done against death. Uh, but death in... Uh, the first part of the Bible, particular, particularly in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Uh, death is presented as kind of the major problem. Oftentimes we think that sin is the major problem, but I think the Bible really holds those two together, but it is sin that opens the door to death, and death is what we are facing. Death in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 is the antithesis, the kind of opposite of life. And so if you look at God's creation narrative in Genesis 1 and 2, it is a bursting everywhere with life. There is abundance, there is flourishing, there is thriving, there is filling, there is uh, blessing. But it all is kind of um, encapsulated in this notion of God bringing forth life. He, he gathers the seas and the dry land and the skies, separates them from one another, and then he inhabits them with living things, plants and animals and fish and birds and humans. And in Genesis chapter 2, kind of the high mark of that is that Jesus, or God rather, places in the midst of the garden the tree of life. And I don't want to fight about whether or not the tree was really a tree or what kind of fruit there was in the tree of life as they ate from that tree, uh, although I suspect it was a Georgia peach. Um, I don't want to debate whether or not it was real or it was metaphorical. What I want to suggest tonight, though, is that whatever the tree of life was, however it works, it stands in for a way of talking about how God is the source of life in the beginning. And when I talk about life, I don't mean just a pulse. I mean life as it was meant to be, like living. And so the tree represents um, life, the connection we have with God, which leads to life. And as a matter of fact, you will notice that in the Genesis narrative, there is nothing that suggests that humans are inherently, like automatically eternal. God didn't make us as automatically eternal things. As a matter of fact, it says in Genesis 2, he uh, made us from the dust of the ground. And you will remember that from dust we are made and to dust we will return. That is uh, the, the thing that we say on Ash Wednesday. We remind ourselves of that fact. Some might say in Genesis 2, but it says that God breathed the breath of life into us and we became living souls, and souls are eternal. But in Hebrew, in that particular part of the Bible, the phrase is nefesh hayah, for living soul, and he calls every living creature in Genesis 1 and 2 nefesh hayah. Uh, the animals are living souls, the birds of the air living souls, the fish of the sea living souls. They're all uh, living souls, nefesh hayah, all made from the dust of the ground. And so what keeps us alive, this is what I'm getting at in Genesis 2, what keeps us alive is access to the tree of life. At the end of Genesis 3, when we are expelled from the garden, which is kind of giving ahead of us, um, he says they have to leave the garden because now that they know between right and wrong, they've eaten of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, if we don't kick them out of the garden, they might continue eating from the tree of life and then they will live forever. That is that the tree of life, um, which I'm arguing is a stand-in for our connection, our relationship, our communion with God. That is the source of life, our access to a relationship with God. And we kind of see that playing out in Genesis chapter 3. 
because in Genesis chapter 3, we are the ones who distance ourselves from God first. It's not like we break some arbitrary rule in Genesis chapter 3 and then God kicks us out. Uh, rather, we rebel against God in eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We, we turn our backs on God in doing that, whatever that entailed. And in doing so, we hide from God. And so in Genesis 3, they eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then they realize they're naked and they're ashamed. And they hear God coming to walk with them in the cool of the evening. God is coming to commune with them. That is what the Genesis narrative is trying to get at. We are meant to live with God. And they hide from him. So by the time we come to the end of Genesis chapter 3, that is really just... Um, an expression, a step beyond what we find at the beginning of Genesis 3, where we're hiding from God. We separate ourselves from God, and in our sin, that separation becomes formalized. We are estranged from God. We have walked away from God, and so things can't continue on like they were before. But notice the way the story is told there. God says in Genesis chapter 2 that when you eat of the tree of the knowledge of the fruit and good and evil, uh, the the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I knew I couldn't say that 10 times fast. Uh, he says, on that day you will die. And the problem with sin, as bad as sin is, is that sin is what opens the door to death. And death is once let loose on our world, the thing that we are really up against and the thing that the scripture is really asking us to face. And this will become clear as we go through, as we head to Easter. But death is the big bad in the creation narrative. It can't be separated from sin, isolated from sin as if it has nothing to do with sin, but what sin does is it opens the door to death. Um, and so what we oftentimes talk about as uh, I was growing up in church in Genesis 3 is we would say, well, God says in Genesis 2 that when they eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when they eat that fruit, they're going to die. And they didn't physically die then, so there's a physical death which happens sometime down the road, and then there's a spiritual death, and must have been the spiritual death that God was talking about in Genesis chapter 2. And what I've determined over the years is I think what we're saying when we talk about that spiritual death is that when we rebel against God, when we turn our back on him, when we, we leave the source of life behind, the only thing left to us is death. The only thing we have left is death. And so in turning our back on God, what we do is we enter into a world where the only possible outcome is death. And we see that everywhere we go, that no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you strive, no matter what you do, death is the thing that comes for all of us. This was uh, a few years back made particularly clear to me. I was listening to an interview on the radio. This uh, reporter for National Public Radio had gone out to uh, apple country at the time of the apple harvest, and they were interviewing farm workers who worked in these apple orchards and they were talking about how expensive fresh fruit is and how many people in America can't afford fresh fruit. And because they can't afford things like fresh fruit and fresh vegetables and fresh meat, then they settle for these empty calories instead. And so we have this obesity epidemic and things like diabetes run amok in our nation. And they're trying to figure out why this stuff is so expensive. And they're interviewing these workers. And one of the things that they realize is that the workers aren't getting paid a whole lot either. And so uh, the person interviewing the farm workers, they ask, they say, are you upset that your employer doesn't pay you more because you can't even afford this fruit that you're harvesting on a regular basis? And they said, no, you've got it wrong. They said, um, our farmer pays us as much as they can, but the profits from growing apples are so low that if he paid us any more, he wouldn't eat either. So everybody here is doing the best they can. And it hit me as I was listening to that, that we live in a situation oftentimes where um, I go to the grocery store and I have a hard time affording things like apples. I have a hard time affording things like broccoli and, and salad and things like that. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. Uh, do the math. How many cheeseburgers from McDonald's can you get for the same price as a head of broccoli at the grocery store? 
And death comes from that. And so somebody says, well, lower the prices of apples and broccoli and things like that. And what we find then is that when we lower the price, then the farmers who are barely eking by in many cases, as it is already, trying their best to pay their workers as much as they can. And they're barely eking by already. If you start charging less for those products, then they get paid less. And so it is death on the one side for those of us who can't afford to buy or afford to buy the products. And is death on the other side for those who can't afford for the price of those products to be lowered. This is one manifestation of the world that we have made. We live in a world where all roads lead to death. And that's what the curses are about at the end of Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, uh, starting about halfway through going through the end of the chapter, we have these curses that God pronounces on the world, but they're not really at the end of the day so much pronouncements as they are God describing what a world where death has a foothold looks like. And it turns out that the um, major characteristic of such a world is that, the, that we live with this, this constant anxiety, uh, this constant fear of death, and that's going to drive things in our lives in a very bad and unhealthy way. But the way he describes it in Genesis 3, he says, you ladies, now you're going to experience pain, more pain in childbirth. And the phrase that he uses there, the word that he uses there in Hebrew is a rare word. It can mean physical pain, but more commonly it means this, this psychic pain, this anxiety, this worry, this fear will now accompany childbirth. As a matter of fact, the same word is going to be used to do, describe the men in just a few minutes. Um, and there it is uh, very clearly an anxiety that comes along with things. And if you think about it for just a minute, there are these two questions that we ask whenever a new child is born. And we are so accustomed to asking those that we don't often sit back and kind of think about the enormity or the weight of asking those questions. But whenever a loved one or a friend or a family member has a new child, the two questions we always ask is number one, is mom okay? Number two, is the baby okay? And why do we ask those questions? And the answer is because we live in a world where oftentimes mom is not okay. And oftentimes baby is not okay. That's what Genesis 3 is getting at. We live in a world now where having a child, bringing a loved one into the world now carries with it this attendant anxiety, this attendant fear, this attendant worry, because death is in the world. The same thing is true just a few verses later of the men. He says, now the earth is going to fight back against you when you plant your crops. And anybody who's ever had a garden... And anybody who's ever been a farmer, you understand the anxiety that comes along with that and all of the things that can go wrong and all of the ways the earth and creation can fight back against you. And he says, you're going to now eat your bread by the sweat of your brow. And that phrase, the sweat of your brow, is an idiom in the ancient world, an expression in the ancient world that is similar to our expression. Man, I was really sweating it. I was really worried about it. It is with anxiety that you will eat your bread. Why? Because now in a world that is controlled by death, oftentimes crops fail. Oftentimes something happens and you can't get the harvest in. Oftentimes markets will crash and you can't get a price to make a living wage from your harvest. Oftentimes there just simply will not be enough to eat. This is the way the world works when death has its foothold. And so... Coming out of Genesis 3, now that death is in charge of the world in a very real way, because we have turned our back on the source of life, and if you turn your back on the source of life, what do you have left but death? Uh, the Genesis story tries to tell us that there is um, a lot to be afraid of. And one of the things that the Bible is, um, is great for, I think the Bible very beautifully does this very powerfully does this is it never downplays the scariness of our world there are in the bible tons and tons of scary thing and the things in the bible treats them as such we live in a world that is full of darkness and brokenness and horrors we live in a world that is full of things that can go wrong and they do even to god's children they go wrong but as we will see just to give you a hint i can't 
can't help but giving you just a hint of this as we will see what the Bible does is it reminds us and it demonstrates in the life of Jesus in this world full of horrors that God is bigger even than the horrors. If you grew up or you had kids who grew up watching Veggie Tales, this is where we start singing, God is bigger than the boogeyman, all right? Um, but death creates this world full of horrors where there are things for us to be afraid of. And in a world controlled by death, the way we address those fears is most often was we try to get power over the things that make us afraid. There are a couple of dynamics I want to spend just a second talking about here because we're running out of time since I'm on my camera instead of my computer. I've uh, got that 20 minute limit, but but Satan, you notice in the Genesis, Genesis account, sits at the back of all of this. He is the serpent. He is the one driving all of this. And Satan, of course, that name given him in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's not so much a name as a title, is the accuser. That's what it means in Hebrew. That's what it means in Greek. Satan is the accuser. And he's the one in the garden who points the finger. Um, God's just telling you that if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that you will die. Really what God is doing is he's holding out on you. He knows that the day that you eat of that fruit, then you will be like him. And he doesn't want you to be like him. He's just being a cosmic party pooper. Satan is pointing the finger. God is the problem. And at the heart of our world that is now a monstrously scary world oftentimes, because death is in the world, the heart of this world, there is this impulse of accusation. And so in Exodus 1, Pharaoh looks out across Egypt and the generations have transpired since the end of Genesis and he has forgotten the contributions Joseph, Joseph has made. All he sees is that the Hebrews, Joseph and his family's descendants, and Hebrew is a phrase that means from beyond the river, something like that. Uh, we might translate it as those who don't belong here. You're not from here. He looks out and he sees that the Hebrews are growing and he's afraid because they represent a threat. If our enemies attack us and um, they uh, side with our enemies, we will be defeated. And so he feels this anxiety, this insecurity, this fear in a world that is controlled by death. And he casts about looking for the reason for that anxiety and he finds someone to blame. The Hebrews are the problem here. And if you pay attention, you will hear that anxiety everywhere in the world around us. And Pharaoh's answer in Exodus chapter 1 is that uh, the way you deal with that anxiety that has been located in a particular person or place or group, there the problem is to get power over them. And so he institutes a policy of slavery for the Hebrews. He forces them to build. And when that doesn't solve the problem, he calls on all patriotic Egyptians to enter into a policy of genocide in the sake or in the name of rather national security. Death leads to fear. Fear prompts accusation. Accusation prompts sin against one another, which brings more death, more fear more accusation, more sin. And we have this downward spiral that we have a hard time getting out of. And so in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, the way that the Hebrews writer describes what Jesus does on the cross is it says that in destroying the devil who holds the power over death, he sets us free from slavery to the fear of death. That is, the problem that we confront in Ash Wednesday is in a world where death is controlled, we are slaves to the fear of death. And I want you to ponder, and we may pick up next week and tease this out just a little bit more before we go back to the God who is present, of what it means for us to live in such a world. But as for right now, I am out of time. My timer is about to expire. My camera is about to go off. Hope you guys are having a good week. Be sure and leave comments, questions, additions, subtractions, any of that fun stuff if you want to. And we will talk to you later. Church, be safe, be careful, stay warm. Love you guys.